Uh, great. So, I hope you feel kind of fully welcomed uh, this morning. Oh, I feel worn out. I've got to say, after that worship time, it just, man, that song always gets me. Every time. Oh, he's doing it again right now. Oh. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. As you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. As he speaks, we get restored, we get repaired. He chose to leave the grave. We should choose to do that too. Yeah. And this is part of the, the, reparate, the repairing and the restoring. It's his word, it's him that's going to do that. And, and those failures that we've been holding on to, those things that are that we haven't seemed to be able to let go of. Yeah. hundred billion of them, yeah. however many there are. He's done everything that's necessary to bring wholeness and healing. And as he speaks, those things happen. So I pray this morning that if I can get up and talk to you, if I can do this, that he will speak to you, that actually my words won't get in the way of his words directly into your heart because his words will bring you life. My words might entertain you for a little bit, but his words will bring you life. They will bring you transformation. They will bring you healing. They will bring you restoration. So that's my prayer this morning. He'll change the story of your life. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. He will change the story of your life. Whatever your life has been, whatever that story has been up to now. So many people in the Bible that we read about have great stories, don't they? But none of them are perfect. None of those people that we read about in the Bible are perfect. They have, they have their own issues. They have their own background. They have their own troubles. But somehow, God takes these ordinary people and they partner with him. They cooperate with him. And the miraculous happens. And he changes their story. And even if you haven't been a churchgoer, for your life, you will have heard some of these stories of people's lives. You will have heard about, I'm sure you've heard about Noah. Noah, a guy who God spoke to and said, build a boat. And he built this 500 foot long boat, like crazy, in a desert, when there'd been no rain. He built the boat in order to save all the animals and save his family. You've probably heard about a guy called Abraham who God spoke to him and told him to move from the land he was in to a new land, a promised land. And right at the end of his life, when he thought the story of his life was done, God said, no. God said, no. I'm going to make you into the father of a whole nation. And of many nations, in fact. You've probably heard about a guy called Joseph, Abraham's uh, great-grandson. Joseph was a, as, as a prisoner. If you've watched... Uh, no, it's not Prince of Egypt, is it? That's King of Dreams or wherever it is. Um, Joseph was a prisoner and a slave. And he rose, he was obedient to God and he rose, his story changed and he became a ruler and actually became a savior to his people. And then Moses, that's the prince of Egypt. Moses, God heard him speaking in a burning bush and, and the story of his life changed. He became God's mouthpiece to Pharaoh and brought his people out of slavery and towards the promised land. And then it was Joshua. Maybe you have heard of Joshua. Maybe you haven't. He's the one who actually brought the nation into the land, into the promised land. Do you remember the, the walls of Jericho? They all marched around the walls of Jericho and, and God brought that miracle, changed the story of a lady called Rahab who was in Jericho. Rahab was one of the Canaanites, one of the people in the promised land who, who God said they should overthrow, but she changed her story. She said, now I'm going to help Israel. And you know, as a result of God, God God made her part of the lineage of Jesus. Changed her life completely. Maybe you've heard about Gideon, who was a, who was a nobody in his family. And his family was a no, nobody in his tribe. They were insignificant. But God called him and he led 300 people to defeat an, an invading army of thousands. Maybe you've heard of Jonah. Jonah, he's quite a popular one, isn't he? We heard of, heard of him in Sunday school. He gets swallowed by a fish, but then he comes out three days later and he preaches repentance to a town and the whole town 
Repent. Crazy. Ordinary people. God speaks a word. He changes their story. And then we come to the New Testament. You know, John the Baptist. You've probably heard of John the Baptist. The guy who proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. He's coming. He's coming, everyone. You've got to be ready. And then the disciples and Paul and Barnabas. All these people who, who took the message of Jesus, took the gospel message of Jesus and spread it around the known world. And so now started a movement that now like reaches billions and billions of people all over the world. God can change a story. I wonder what the story of your life has been. I wonder how, which bits of your life you want to be remembered for. I suspect if you're anything like me, there's stuff in your life that you do want to be remembered for. Right? There's stuff that's happened, the, the successes, the, the good stuff, the times, I love it, the times when I've been obedient to God and I've seen him move and it's been incredible. When I've, you know, he's told me to pray for somebody or pray for a situation and I've done that and I've seen a miracle. I want to be remembered for that. The times when I've heard his voice to say, give up your job right now because I've got something better for you and I've done it in faith and sure enough, a few weeks later I'm in a new career. And it's something I love doing. Or he told us to, to take our family and move from one part of the country to another part of the country because he's got something better for us. And we move and we live in his blessings. I want to be remembered for those times. Yeah? I don't want to be remembered for the times when I haven't been that. Yeah. And there have been plenty of those times too, let me tell you, where I've heard his voice and I haven't responded. Where I haven't done, when actually there's just been some muppetry. Actually, let me tell you a time when there was some muppetry in my own life. Before I got married, before we were married, I was, you know, through with my girlfriend or fiance, we went on holiday with my, with my parents and my family to Dawlish. And I remember a time we were in the swimming pool. This is a crazy story, it's true, but it's crazy. We're in the, we're in the swimming pool, and, and because we weren't married yet, I was still in that stage when I'm trying to impress her. Trying to impress her, you know, show how, show how good I am at swimming and, and how, actually how big my lungs are, how long I can hold my breath for. And I saw her, she was at the far end of the swimming pool and I was at this end of the swimming pool and I dived in and I swam underwater all the way to where she was and I pulled on her leg from underneath. I thought that was funny, right? I thought this would be the funniest thing. But she kicked me and I thought... No, 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 she'll get this. She'll get the joke. She'll eventually get the joke. So I kept pulling. Still hasn't come up for air yet. Because I've got, I was a trumpeter. I had big lungs. I could stay under there for a long time, right? And so I just kept pulling and pulling. And she kept kicking and kicking. And then it suddenly dawned on me, maybe she doesn't realize that it's me pulling on her leg. So I kind of I surface. And it's then that I see Fru sat on the pool side over there. <laughs> True story. True story. I didn't turn around to look at the lady whose leg I'd been pulling. I went back down again. I can hold my breath for a long time. I went back to the other end of the pool. Honest to God, that, hap that happened, right? That happened. That happened. I don't want to be remembered for that. I want you to forget that story. There's all this stuff in all of our lives, stuff that we do want to remember and stuff that we don't want to be remembered for. There's one person in the Bible who I didn't mention in my list who would have had a lot of stories, lots of great stuff in his life. There's whole kind of books devoted to this guy. This guy is introduced to us as a, as a shepherd boy, a young lad. But he would eventually become the king. Not just a king, he would become the king. He would become the greatest king that Israel ever known. And again, he would be part of the lineage of Jesus. Jesus himself would come from his line. And this is the only person in the Bible who God says this statement about. This is amazing words. Um, actually, I haven't got the fruit. Charlotte, would you press forward to the next slide? Thank you. God says these words. He said, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So actually, this is, this is in Acts. This is Paul speaking. This is Paul's first preach, if you like. Okay? And he's giving a bit of background to Jesus. And he says this, but this isn't Paul's idea. This is, Paul is not giving us Paul's thoughts. Paul is telling us what God says about David. 
God testified about him. He's a man after my own heart. It's quite a statement. Nobody else is described this way in scripture. And it's a great epitaph. And I want, I would love that to be my epitaph too. A man after God's own heart. And I want you to want that epitaph too. I want you to want to have that as your, as your goal, as your intention, as your dream. To, to be that man too. To, have that, to be that man that God says, or that woman that God says, this is a person after my own heart. And if I want to be like that, maybe I need to find out some clues about what, what it was that David did. What did he have that made God say this about him. So we're going to look at David a little bit this morning. And I want you to imagine some of the stories that David uh, himself told about himself to his son. I kind of imagine if, if David was sat on his chair and his son Solomon, who would be the next king, comes and sits on his lap. And he's there and, and David's telling Solomon all about his life. He says, son, t- let me tell you about the time when I was looking after sheep. I wasn't much older than you. And, and a lion came and a bear came. And I had to deal with these things with my own bare hands. Great stories. Let me tell you about the time when this kind of nine foot giant called Goliath came and wanted to destroy the armies of Israel. And I took my sling and a stone and I dealt with him. Great story. Let me tell you about the time when Saul the king was trying to kill me. He was trying to get me and God looked after me. Let me tell you about the time when your brother Solomon, when your brother Absalom, when he was trying to get me. He was trying to kill me and take the throne for himself. But God spared me. He looked after me. And he looked after my family. He looked after you. Let me tell you about the time when, when all these battles that I faced. And I won. You know there's a whole chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 8 is a whole chapter just dedicated to all the, uh, David's victories. Amazing. So many of them. Let me tell you about the time when the Ark of the Covenant, we, I brought it back from where the Philistines had it, back into Jerusalem. The man we celebrated that day. That was a great day. He might also tell you about the times when he messed up. Let me tell you about the time, son, that I did the wrong thing. I really, really messed up with your mother. And God forgave me. In his mercy, God forgave me. So many great stories he's a legend I look at David and actually as I was when I was a young boy I don't know if, what you did but when the when the guy was preaching we had long services when I was a boy like three hours long didn't we um, and I used to read the stories of David in my Bible I used, and just devour, every week I would just devour I used to love David because David's a man's man right all the fighting like there's a warrior, he's a king, he's an influence, he just wants to fight, he wants to battle. This is what men like. Men, are, men like the whole fighting thing. We watch MMA. I don't watch MMA. Fabiano watches MMA. <laughs> yeah. But men, men like this stuff. Men come out of Rocky films, don't they? And they think they're a boxer. And they, go, Bam. they come out of Bruce Lee films and they want to do kung fu. Women don't do that. Women don't come out of chick flicks, out of watching Pride and Prejudice, and say, oh, put down your crocheting and let's take a turn around the garden. (laughs) They don't do that. But David is a man's man. Look at who he hung out with. He had all these warriors. He had these, David's, what he called his mighty men. He's 30. There was 30 guys. And there was David's three guys as well. There was a guy, let me tell you, a guy called Josheb the Tekemenite. The Bible tells of Joshua, right? Joshua, who killed 800 men with a, sp- not a spoon, with a spear. <laughs> that would be good, with a spoon. No, with a spear, he killed 800 men. Or let me tell you about uh, Eleazar, the Ahohite, who was in the shield wall of Israel's army, to facing the Philistine army, and all the rest of the Israelite army ran away and left him on his own. But he stood there, and he stood his ground, and he fought them. Mighty men. David was a warrior, and he hung out with warriors. And it's why I like to hang out with Dean. <laughs> Dean is a warrior. This week, you know, Dean chased robbers, guys who were trying to rob a building near his house. He chased, I think there were 800 of them, weren't there? And you had a spoon, right? <laughs> Dean is a man's man. I love Dean. He's a, David is a man's man. But he's not just a man's man, he's a woman's man. 
Read, read what he writes in the Psalms. David is sensitive. Like, he's a poet. He's an artist. What does he say? He says, you know, one of the things in his song, he said, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. He's a musician. He's a songwriter. It's amazing things. He's passionate. He dances. Women love that stuff. <laughs> Every wedding we go to, Fru wants me to dance, and I am a terrible dancer. But I do try and, I do try and dance just once. I know my duty. I try and dance just once. But David, he loved to dance. He was a dancer. Listen to, actually, listen to this. This is what somebody says about David. Uh, they were looking for somebody to help King Saul. King Saul kept having these, these, these bad moods, a, a bad spirit come on him, and they wanted somebody to come and help King Saul. And there was a servant who said this about David. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. That's like a guitar. So he's a musician. And again, women love musicians. He say he's a brave man and a warrior. Ladies like that. They like to be looked after. They say he speaks well. He talks. Yes. He's a man who speaks. Like that's most of my trouble comes from the fact that I'm not very good at speaking. And then they say, and it says, and he's a fine looking man. <laughs> this is David. So he's a musician. He's brave. He speaks. And he's a fine looking man. For all those single women, this is like your Tinder list, right? This is, this is it. And then to, to top it all off, he says, and the Lord is with him. Yeah. The Lord is with him. So he's a man's man. He's a woman's man. But, but kind of. Above all those things, what really sets him apart is he's God's man. He's God's man. You probably know the story, or maybe you've heard it, when, when uh, God gets Samuel the prophet to come to Bethlehem and to anoint the next king of Israel. Saul has messed up, and he's like, I'm sorry I made this guy king. And you need to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and anoint the guy who's going to be the next king. And Samuel comes into Jesse's house, and Jesse brings all his, his, his strapping young sons, and they're all standing there. And Samuel thinks to himself, yeah, one of these guys, for sure, they look the part. And what does God say to Samuel? He says, look, man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And it's only when he's pushed that Jesse calls for David to come from the fields, the young lad who's looking after the sheep in the fields and it's only at that moment you know, that he brings David in and God says to Samuel yes I pick you God looks at his heart he said this is a man after my own heart he will do everything I want him to do your prayer this morning Dan when we were praying together that was your prayer this morning wasn't it when we were in our pre-service prayer meeting, praying that you know, we wouldn't be just hearers, but we would be doers. And this has been kind of a theme over the last few weeks. A disciple is not somebody who hears. It doesn't say, he hears everything I want him to hear. It doesn't say, he believes everything I want him to believe. It doesn't even say, he says or knows everything I want him to know. It says, this is a guy who is after my own heart. He does everything I want him to do. And that's what we need to be as disciples. And this is what makes us disciples, because it's, our, it's what we do that will change the story of our life. It's the decisions we make. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh, here goes Adam again, with that old thing that he keeps bringing back. Every flipping week, he says, I don't say it every week, but I say it quite a lot, that my favorite axiom of all time, it's direction, not intention, that determines destination. It's direction, not intention, that determines our destination. And I think I want to elevate that even to another level this morning. I know I've said it a lot of times before. Does anybody know what an end run is? An end run. An end run. Some of you. Some of you. Okay. I'm going to try something different. Hold on a sec. I'm going to become a coach this morning. Okay? So bear with, bear with me. This is exciting. If this works, if this works, then, yeah, that will be memorable. something memorable, very memorable. Um, there we go. Oh, look at that. Great. Okay, so 
I'm an American football coach right now. Okay, and we're talking about our play. So an end run. You've got, in American football, you've got, these are people. You've got the defense. Okay, and they're kind of moving in that direction. You've got the offense kind of here. Kind of like two armies facing each other. Kind of moving in that direction. And at a particular point in the game, you've got this, the offense is trying to get the ball, which is kind of shaped like that, from here across the line over here for, you've probably heard the word, a touchdown. All right, they've got to get this through the, this ball, through the defense to the touchdown line back here. Tricky thing. So if you're the quarterback, okay, the quarterback, let's go, let's draw my quarterback here, QB. He's got the ball. He's got a couple of options. He can either throw the ball. If one of his guys has managed to run through the defense, he can try and throw the ball to them in order to get a touchdown. Or the quarterback can take the ball, pick it up, and he can run with it and try and get through. And hopefully, these guys who are trying to protect him have stopped all the defense guys, and he manages to run through. But there's another way through as well. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll make an end run. And who's going to make an end run? What they do is they go, the quarterback will take the ball all the way around and go to the end of their defensive line and try and sneak past that way. It's kind of a bit like a feint. They try and trick them and, and, then, and then go around them, make an, make an end run around them. This will all become clear in a moment, what I'm talking about. It's good to have good intentions. It's good to have dreams, and it's good to have goals. But I do think that we, and people in general, act as if that's enough. We act as if our dreams, our goals, our intentions, our wants, our wishes, will somehow make an end run around our decisions. And they won't. It's the decisions that we make that will determine where, where we end up. Not our goals. Our goals will never bypass the decisions and the things that we do. Let me just go back. Yes. Right. Would you put the next slide up, Charlotte? Actions trump intentions every time. This is why Jesus said, you've got to be doers of the word. You can't just be hearers of the word. You've got to do because actions will trump your intentions every time. And David, he knew this, and he acted on it. For the most part, he did everything that God wanted him to do. And we're going to look at a single example from David's life. This is one of the stories that I'm sure he recounted again and again. And we're going to look at this account, and we're going to get an important truth that I hope we can apply to our own lives that's going to help us live as disciples. Let me just fill in a few historical gaps. So we should, I've just said, yeah, David's been anointed, but Saul is still the king. David has now killed Goliath and kind of helped defeat, defeat the Philistine army. He, he's now got people, the, the men and the women in the street, singing about him. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Man, that's going to wind him up, right? He sees that David has kind of befriended his son, his son Jonathan. Jonathan has become best buddies with David. Now Jonathan, Saul is there thinking, well, Jonathan, surely Jonathan is going to be the heir to the throne. But David... And they all, it looks like David is trying to get the throne, and, and it makes Saul mad. And Saul gets to a point where he wants to kill David. And it gets so bad that David has to eventually run away and hide. And David takes a few men with him, maybe his mighty men, but he takes them away with him, and they're hiding as far away from Saul as possible. And so we come to a place in the Bible, 1 Samuel 24. Saul hears that David is hiding out in the desert of En Gedi. Okay, so he hears this, and what does he do? He gets, he says, the Bible tells us he gathers 3,000 of his best warriors. Now that should tell you something, because David is hiding out with a handful of guys. Saul gets 3,000 of his best warriors to come and get him. That tells us something about who David was, all right? And... And this is where it gets a bit crazy. Uh, Saul, the, the, Saul and his army, they're marching to, to try and find David. And they come to this valley. And in this valley, there, there are these caves dotted around. And Saul, at this moment, decides that he needs to relieve himself. It's all in the Bible. It's, it sounds weird, I know. But he needs to go to the toilet, okay? And not just the number one, I think, all right? So he's, he's got to go. Um, excuse me. All right. <laughs> and so he doesn't want anybody seeing him. So he says to his commander, look, I'm just going to go to this cave. And I'm going to 
I'm going to do my business, and then I'll come back. Quite by chance, quite by coincidence, this is the cave that David is hiding in with his men. You're like, what? That is crazy. So I want you to picture the scene. David has gone into this cave. He's at the back of this cave with his men. He's waiting, I would imagine, for Saul and his armies to go past so he can come out again and, and, and go and hide somewhere else. But then suddenly, the king walks in by himself, takes off his weapons, starts to shed some of his armor, and begins to do his business. Right there in front of David and his guys. And this is great. This is what the men say. You can imagine all the men around David, like, this is it. Um, he's whispering because he's in a cave, right, with, with soldiers there. This is the day the Lord spoke about when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. This is it. David, it's gone. Amazing. And the men are ecstatic. They can't believe what God has done. They can't believe. You see, even on a human level, this is incredible. Right? This is the guy that's been trying to kill David. David can now kill Saul. And it's kind of pretty much self-defense because this guy's trying to kill him. And, and in this moment, you know, David can possibly end the civil war, end the fighting, end the bloodshed, and come out and take his rightful place as king. The opportunity is there. That's on a human level. But even beyond the human level, there's a, there's a bit of a divine level going on there. His men are saying, this is not just a good idea. This is a God idea. This is a God idea. Just one death. Maybe we'll reunite the country again. And so David, the pressure on David in this moment is enormous. He may, he's got to make a quick decision. Saul is nearly finished. Um, will this opportunity ever arise again? What does David do? What would I do? Would I grab it? What would you do? Would you take that opportunity? Because even if, even if the process seems a little skew, if the outcome is right, the outcome is the right outcome, would you take, you know, the end justifies the means, right? In any given moment, in every decision that we make, there are different levels at play. I'm going to go back to my iPad again. Okay, so in every decision, every choice that we have, there are different levels going on. All right, first level, let's have a look at this. I'm going to draw a cloud here. That's a cloud, by the way. We've got our ultimate desires. Ultimate desires, okay? We all have them. Everybody has these high-level desires for their life. The thing that they, the story, they want their story of their life to be. They want to have kind of, I guess, an amount of financial security, they want a great marriage, maybe, maybe a healthy family, a happy home. Everybody wants a happy home. Success at work. These things kind of live at this high level above us, and they exist. And we want the story of our life to be generally, to be generally good. And these are our ultimate desires. Everybody, everybody has them, and they sit above everything else. And if we make our decisions with these, just these ultimate desires in mind, we'll end up going in the direction that we want to go. Pretty much. But as well as our ultimate desires, we have something else going on down here. We have our immediate desires. Okay, so these are the things where you're kind of sitting at home on an evening and you just start to feel a bit snacky and so you go to the cupboard and you pull out a packet of biscuits and before you know it you've eaten the whole packet or maybe there's a bit of chocolate cake that you weren't going to finish but then it's just the temptation is too much or maybe you kind of you you feel like you should be doing some work but then the tv's on and there's netflix a uh, thing you've been watching and you just want to watch another episode and it turns into two episodes or three episodes these are the things where you get that instant dopamine hit you know that that thing that makes you feel good in a moment you wanted to save but actually you paid your paychecks come in and you feel like actually i want to go and do a bit of retail therapy that will make me feel better for a, for a little while anyway um you end up doing you know uh, 
doing the wrong thing towards someone, get, trying to get your own back on somebody because they've, they've hurt you. These are our immediate desires. These are like temptations. And sometimes these immediate desires will lead us towards our ultimate desires. Sometimes. But more often than not, our immediate desires move us in the opposite direction to the things that we ultimately want. They do. So we have a choice. Do we make a decision based on what we ultimately want? All the high level stuff? Or do we make a decision in the moment that will satisfy a short term craving but will ultimately move us away from where we ultimately want to be? We have the desire to be, to be debt free or to have savings. But we can't seem to stop spending the money as it comes in on things that we don't really need. We have the desire to be lighter or fitter or healthier. Okay, good desires. But then we can't seem to stop eating and we don't exercise. We make the decision to not exercise. We have the desire to do well in our exams and to get good grades or to be successful at work and put the work in. But then we get sidetracked by the things of this world and it stops us moving. We want to be closer to God. We want to be that disciple he's looking for. But then when the alarm goes off and it's early in the morning, we were going to get up and read our Bibles and we just say, I'm just going to have a few more minutes in bed. Let's go back to David. Because David, he's got his immediate desires in this moment, in this cave. His immediate desire, he wants to get revenge on the guy who's been chasing him, trying to kill him. He wants to be able to go back to his family and stop running and hiding. He's also got these ultimate desires, the desires that are not bad, that God has called him to be the next king. He's got these ultimate desires to be king and to end the civil war. But for David, we need to understand there is another level as well. And this level should be there for all the followers of Jesus. I'm just going to draw a bit of a rainbow up there. And I'm going to call these meta desires because they're above our ultimate desires. Meta just means overarching, above everything else. And actually, I was going to say meta desire, just one desire. And David's desire was to, in all his decisions, to honor God, to praise God, to worship God, and to please God. A meta desire to please God. What does this look like in practice? What does pleasing God look like in our daily lives? The Bible tells us that we, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So it starts from a foundation of trust. It starts from a foundation of faith. If our biggest desire, if our meta desire, which is all the way up here and encompassing everything else, is to please God, then we need faith to do that. We need to be up operating from a position of faith. Our decisions need to be operating from a place where we, we're trusting God. God, absolutely trusting God. Being a person after God's own heart means to have absolute faith, to have absolute trust in God. So we should be asking ourselves, if I, it, we're faced with a decision, if I take this advantage, am I, am I really demonstrating trust in God? If I'm not declaring all my income on my tax returns, am I demonstrating that I have absolute trust in God? If I'm getting one over on somebody else to elevate myself, or if I'm borrowing stuff from work, or if I'm taking cash for a job so I don't have to declare it, if these opportunities are coming up, and maybe the people around you would say, well, nobody's getting hurt. You deserve it. But the question we should be asking is, if I do this, am I showing that I trust God with my whole life? Am I showing absolute trust in God? Does this choice I make lead me towards the story I want my life to tell. For myself, I've, I've told you this before, I used to love entering competitions. All the time I would send things off and, and I would win occasionally. And then God spoke to me and he said, when you do that, are you showing that you absolutely trust me? And you know, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with entering raffles and stuff, that's all good. But for me, that's something that I do. I don't enter those things anymore because I know, God, I trust that you will provide, you will be my provider, you are everything I need. What is there in your own life 
that you could lay aside. I'm going to go over a little bit this morning. Is that okay? I've just got a little bit more to say. So let's see what David does in this moment. From verse 4, he says this, David crept up, sure. David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. These men are going, you're worried about that? You didn't even hurt him. He said, no. he, said he, he felt terrible. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And it says that Saul left the cave and went on his way. Why would David respond like this? Because he is a man after God's own heart. And so for David, all these thoughts are going around. In that moment, he can see Saul there. He's got this decision to make. He said, God, you've said I'm going to be king. And this seems like a crazy golden opportunity for that to happen. But I also know that your word says that we shouldn't harm the king. We shouldn't murder your anointed. So... So I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to trust that your will will come about. I'm going to trust that the word you've said to me about me being king is going to come to pass anyway. I'm going to trust that you'll provide another opportunity for this to happen. That your plans will come in your time and in your way. Solomon, David's son, writes this in Proverbs uh, 3. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I imagine he's... He was channeling David at this point. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your decisions, in all your choices, in all your actions, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. He will get you in the direction that you want to go. He will make sure that you're in the right, moving in the right direction. Later on in his life, when God finally dealt with Saul, And David became king. I am absolutely certain that he looked back on this moment and just felt relief that he'd made the decision that he'd made. And he doesn't have to tell the story to his grandchildren. His grandchildren don't come up to him and say, Granddad, tell us the time about when you were bravely hiding in a cave and you skewered Saul while he was on the potty. It's a story you wouldn't want. But instead of that, he's got a story of great faith. The story of his life as a man after God's own heart. It's a great story for us to learn from. And I want that to be my story. I want that to be your story. God is the same God. He still does miracles, you know. He still does those things. He still specializes in taking ordinary people with lives that are a little bit messed up with kind of backgrounds and history and stories of damage and stuff that we don't like we don't like to look at he specializes in taking them and turning them around he's a miracle working God he will do that and God isn't looking for cleverness he's not looking for ability he's looking for availability He's looking for a people who say, me, here I am. And he's looking for obedience. Yep, I will do everything you want me to do. Availability and obedience, that's the currency of God's kingdom. To be a person after God's own heart. Are you willing to be that disciple? Are you willing to be be Noah? To hear that voice? And despite everything going on around you, to build that thing that he's telling you to build? Are you willing to be Abraham? To go where God's telling you to go? Are you willing to be uh, Joshua? Whatever the world around me says, whoever they're following, as for me and my household, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Are you willing to be Moses, to be the mouthpiece to the people that God is sending you to? Are you willing to be Rahab, leaving that past behind you and starting on a new future, a new journey? Are you willing to be Gideon, despite your weaknesses, ready to lead, ready to step up, say, I'm available? God has called you like he called those people to to have great faith and to take great risks 
I don't know, when was the last time you took a great risk for the kingdom? When was the last time you took a great risk for the kingdom? When you demonstrated absolute faith in God, where you knew, actually, if God isn't in this, then this is going to go terribly wrong. When was the last time you took a great risk? Because all these people took great risks, and we love their stories, but that story can be our story. And maybe we need a shift, a shift in our thinking, a shift in the way we act, to be ready and obedient to the life that he's calling us to have. Are you ready to write a different story? A story that embraces the potential of a future that hasn't happened yet. Amen.